Oliver Morris at the University of Nottingham, a good friend of mine, political economy, always described the paradox in the economics literature that we were brilliant at finding reasons and models to explain why politics failed, but we were terrible at finding explanations for why politics might work. And if you think of it, all of our political economy models explain why it doesn't work. But we don't have good models that explain how might it work. So from your discussions, what would, would you have any suggestions for how can anybody contributing to creating the incentives for politicians to do the right thing? Thank you very much. I'm Peter Quarty from University of Ghana. Um, Prof. Saiti, thank you very much for the thought-provoking uh, presentation. You spoke about the political business cycle, and uh, I want to throw it back to you. What do you think African government should do to reverse this political business cycle, where we spend three years to mess up, and then spend a year to, sorry, a year to mess up, and then spend three years to clean up? Thank you. Okay, there was here in the middle. Mark, close to you, Hans. Hi, I'm Mark Dre from, from DFID. Um, I have a question relating to uh, what challenges increasing complexity poses to, to democracy and, and the role of the individual in, in democracy. Uh, and part of Rachel's uh, comments there were that voters don't support the things that are in their best interest. But in order for them to do so, they need to understand what's in their best interest. And earlier we were at a session with, uh, about the international financial system and there was this idea that after the financial crisis we didn't get further with reforms. And I thought partly that's because to push our governments to get further with reforms means the average person on the street understands enough about the international financial system to know what's wrong with it to push for those reforms to fix it. I'm not sure they understand. They don't seem to understand that vaccinations are a good thing. <laughs> so, and I'm just curious to know how, how do we square that circle? Thank you for a very interesting and stimulating lecture. Um, a strong theme going through the lecture, aside from what you said about democracy, was about the need for industrial policy. And I felt that it was not the Democrats' fault that people don't have an industrial policy. Countries have been told for decade after decade that it's wrong to have an industrial policy. And maybe if now the conversation changed in a very powerful way and everyone was agreed that they should have an industrial policy. This could be superimposed upon democracy in such a way that, all right, you have your problems that you've mentioned, but at least you also have a structure of planning um, which would enable you to go, go through them with hiccups, but at least to go in the right direction. Thank you for a very interesting lecture, Ernest. Two questions. Uh, first, uh, if we consider the experience of Asia, uh, political democracy has been neither necessary nor sufficient to create a developmental role for states. Um, now, I think of democracy as a prior, but we need to recognize that political democracies are about institutionalized checks and balances, but they evolve slowly. Uh, they create self-correcting mechanisms uh, are you perhaps coming to a conclusion too soon that democracy is not conducive to development uh, in Africa? Uh, or could it be that democracy is in its very early stages? It's at best electoral democracy without rights uh, for citizens, civil, political, social. Uh, so the two questions in a sense are um, independent. Uh, it is possible to get industrial policies and governments that are developmental in their roles without democracy. We've seen that happen in Asia. Uh, but it is also possible to think of democracies being the only institution that might serve longer term objectives dis despite short termism in political cycles. Okay, thanks. I'll take one more question up here in the front uh, and then allow Ernest to uh, 
comment, reply? Thank you very much, Prof. Um, when I saw the topic, I thought that we were driving into a cul-de-sac because um, uh, politics and economics have never been good bedfellows. <laughs> so uh, I knew that uh, the results was going to be what it was. However, there is, uh, I mean, despite political economy anyway, but, but I think I've never been able to resolve this uh, the issue of chicken and egg, which comes first. Is it a democracy that engenders development, or it is a development that rather engenders democracy, proper democracy, so to speak? So I, I don't know what your thoughts are. Um, some people think that you need to develop first and democracy will come along. Others think just go and you know, have democracy, you know, whatever it is, and then development will follow you. That's my conundrum. Thank you very much. Ernest, that was quite a rich yeah. list of questions. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, we, we, we do have here a very rich set of uh, uh, questions and comments. Uh, Oliver is asking about how we create the right incentive for uh, uh, politicians to do the, the right thing. Um, that's the main reason why we should, as a people, always have in mind having the right institutions. Uh, the right institutions uh, provide the checks and balances that uh, uh, Deepak was talking about. Those right institutions. So if you have a parliament, for example, as a result of the new democratic dispensation, there are things that we should require the parliament to do, uh, uh, which will be of a developmental nature. And as a result of the space that we create for the parliament to perform that, uh, other politicians will be forced or obliged to fall in line. Uh, so long as we leave it, uh, everything to the discretion of, of politicians, I, I'm not sure that's going to happen. Uh, so they, they, we, we've got to write out more formally the kinds of things that uh, we expect in the long term. Uh, we've, we've tried in Ghana to uh, consider at various meetings uh, the efforts to legislate uh, what government can spend or cannot spend, providing limits to how far the budget can go. Uh, is that the kind of thing that we want? We don't, we don't need to go that far. Uh, we don't need to legislate everything, but it's important to set the right tone Having institutions that are, we do have a, a planning commission in Ghana. Uh, everybody knows in Ghana that the only reason why you, are, you get sent to the planning commission is to get you out of the way. You know? So how, how do you strengthen the planning commission? These are, th if you have a strong planning commission, like what they have in India, uh, it can influence the way the politics is done. Uh, Peter says, how do we deal with the political business cycle? It's basically, uh, the kind of things. But I think people are becoming more and more discerning in many countries. Uh, they're able to see through uh, what politicians are up to. Uh, and the fact that from time to time we see changes in the government as a result of uh, the elections, uh, so, so it, it makes me a lot more hopeful, uh, a lot more hopeful that uh, in the not too distant future, uh, politicians, uh, and, and this is, a bit of what uh, Rachel said, uh, the kind of uh, pork barrel politics that we see in Africa, you find everywhere in the world, uh, except that in Africa, it does cause more trouble for us than it does elsewhere. That, that's the basic difference. Uh, Francis wanted to know whether the, the uh, absence of an industrial policy was the uh, fault of uh, absence of democracy. No, that's not the point that I, I make at all. Um, I do suggest that um, because we are not using the democratic institutions to push for uh, longer term development, uh, which in a way is the same to what, what I said to Oliver, uh, because we're not doing that, it becomes possible then for political agents uh, to only then pursue the short-term interests. The absence of an industrial policy uh, can happen also under uh, an autocratic system. Um, but how do we use a democracy to do that? How do we bring up... So what a democracy should be doing is fostering more debate 
uh, more discussion of what should go into the industrial policy. Uh, what kind of sectors are we going to support? What kind of winners are we willing to? So a democracy makes more discussion uh, possible than will have been the case in an autocracy. Uh, Deepak, I agree with you that democracy is a prior. Uh, I, I agree with your, your position that uh, in Asia, uh, we've seen more of an evolution of these democratic systems that have fostered um, uh, um, the, the, the developmental state. And your own country, India, is a very good example of that. Uh, I'm not at all suggesting that uh, uh, we, we, we should forget about the uh, uh, democratic state in Africa. No, that's not the point. Uh, my point is that the democracies in Africa are still maturing. And uh, in that process of maturing, uh, many of them are ignoring things that are in the longer term interest of their people. So we've got to fix the way the democracies work. Uh, I will be the last person to um, uh, shun democracy. Um, I, I believe in it. I, I believe strongly that democracy can work, uh, but it will do so only under certain conditions. And those conditions include having the right institutions in place. Uh, for me, a major right institution is a properly functioning parliament, a, a properly functioning judici a judiciary, and properly functioning civil society. So these are elements of what I consider a good uh, democracy. Um, Tony, your question is, uh, which comes first? Uh, I, this is not, uh, th there's enough evidence that uh, uh, democracies can support the developmental state. And also enough evidence that uh, uh, in countries where the economy is performing well, it becomes easier for democracies to uh, function. Uh, the, the, the leaders that are in states where the economy is doing well have little to fear. So they allow freedom of speech, usually. That's the kind of thing. They allow people to compete for the right to own things. They allow more freedoms to exp for expression and uh, so on. Uh, so there's enough. It's not a matter of which one comes first. There's, if you look at the literature, there's a whole ton of uh, studies of this nature. It's not the most important thing. For me, how do you use democracy in Africa? That's what I'm looking at. How do you use the institutions that come with democracy? OK, thanks. Other questions? Yes, in the very back. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Wisdom Akpalu, and I'm with UNU Wider. Uh, Professor Aite, thank you very much for such an interesting presentation. Unfortunately, I'm not very optimistic, <laughs> like you, and this is why. The process that deliver political leadership in most of these African countries are inherently corrupt. How do people become politicians? or win political power. They do so by investing. They have to campaign. And where do they get the money? Most of the time, they get the money from uh, individuals or in, uh, uh, you know, individuals or businesses that have interest. And they sign contracts that become effective as soon as they step into office. How will someone who benefits from a weak institutions be ready to clean up these institutions when they get to office? That is the reason why most politicians will never improve their institutions when they are in office. They will not let the laws work so that people can take them to court for contracts that they signed before even coming to office. And that it becomes even more serious when you have collusion uh, between political parties. You have two political, dominant political parties in a country like Ghana, and they, what, they look out for each other. So how do we get from this state to building a clean institution. Unfortunately, I don't have the answers, <laughs> and I'm not that optimistic. I'm not a political scientist, but I have a burning question on, on this one. Um, can you comment on two, two countries, Ethiopia and uh, Rwanda, who became more industrialized before they became more democratic? Uh, link that. Uh, to the risk of leadership, especially when it comes to choosing the right set of policies, long-term policies, and, and the risk of being uh, right 
type of leader and how can we support risk taking in this environment? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ernest. And my name is Jogona Dungu from the African Economic Research Consortium. I was listening to Ernest and I was ask, asking myself, do we actually know the objective function of our politicians, uh, especially when they go to office? In fact, I was, when I was listening to you, I realized that since 2002, for example, if I take Kenya as example, we have had several coalitions. Every, every new election, there are different coalitions. No, no coalition has taken the government for two terms. It's only one term and then there's a new coalition. So it's quite interesting whether we know the objective function of the politicians. And for this, let me perhaps start the story from a, a little bit further. I remember in 2001, Paul Collier started this project of trying to explain civil, uh, sorry, um, uh, should I say, uh, civil wars in Africa. And one of the dominant explanations about civil wars was that presence of rootable resources, that is, you can root the resources and coordinate a, a rebellion against the government. That's what was sustaining civil wars. But as we developed this project, towards 2002, 2003, I think Kenya was included in that sample. And my question was, but we haven't had civil war in Kenya. Now I said, no. I think if you look at the ethnic violence around election time in 1992, 97, and a bit of, uh, a bit of that, then there is, this is a dog that didn't bark, so it was included as a, as a case study. But it was now me and uh, Professor Mwangi Kemenyi to explain what was really happening. But our strong conclusion, just to tie up with what I was asking before, is that actually uh, being in government was like a, a rootable resource. You could use the rules or the laws that exist, or even enact new ones to affect resources to yourself. This is consistent with what he was really saying. You can affect resources to yourself, either using the existing laws or even enacting new ones. And maybe that is where we are. That is why, then, if you are now asking why we don't have economic transformation, even after repeated elections and all that, maybe it is because the objective function actually is totally different. Maybe, I don't know whether you relate that. The Kenyan case showed very well in terms of that. And that, that book is published in 2005. And I think the political violence in 2007, somebody called me and asked me, do you change your conclusions given the political violence that took place in 2007-2008? And I actually argued that it enhances the conclusions. Maybe uh, that could be uh, something that we can, uh, we can uh, perhaps push some light on. My name is Bayomi Magwagwela from the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development in Nigeria. Yes, there has been, we know predominantly that the population of Africa is young and there's been a huge focus on Africa's youth as a future, an engine for change. What would you think their role will be in the whole process of uh, transformation, knowing fully well that a lot of them may not have grown to know democracy or democratic tenants? Also, I would like to get your perspective on the African Continental Free Trade Agreement that has been purported now to be uh, a model that would change economies. And uh, for a country or my government who was refused in a way to sign it, what would you think, what would, you be, uh, would be your perspective on that? Thanks. Okay, the very last question, Paul, you'll get that one. Paul Mosley, University of Sheffield. You mentioned a number of governments, including your own, which have been very good at democracy, but not good at transformation. But no one has mentioned the one, certainly one, African government, which has been very good at democracy over a long period, and over that same period, very good at transformation, which is Mauritius. What do you think we can learn from them? Okay. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Ernest. So, another set of rich questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think the first came from Wisdom, uh, who, went, who was not so optimistic. He didn't see how uh, the politicians could, could uh, clean up uh, uh, the act. Um, I understand Wisdom perfectly. Um, I don't expect politicians to do it. I expect the society uh, to lead the charge I expect, so, we, so why do I give such a talk? I, I give this kind of talk in the hope that uh, it will resonate with the other Africans uh, and they will understand the need for us to uh, have uh, a discussion back home. Um, so I expect 
civil society, I expect universities, I expect NGOs, I expect uh, the, the, the everybody to, to, to be discussing this. Uh, unemployment is a big challenge anywhere in Africa, whether it's uh, Ethiopia or every, unemployment is a big challenge. And yet, very, very few African governments uh, discuss how to tackle it. What is going to happen, they set up a committee uh, that should think about some program that provides jobs for a select group of people. Everybody knows it's, it's a structural issue. How do you engage with it? You know, so we, we need to be a lot more confrontational. We need to force governments to have a, a, a change of uh, mind about these. That long-term development cannot be uh, uh, pushed aside. That, that's basically the, the message. Uh, Jerusalem was interested in the Rwandan and the Ethiopian uh, examples, wanting to know which one uh, began. I'm not sure that either Ethiopia or Rwanda can be described as industrialized. Uh, certainly, they've seen improvements in the performance of the economies. Uh, and we saw that in Ethiopia first, and then we saw uh, the R Rwandan uh, uh, act. The, 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 for me, the most important question is how these positive gains, or these gains that have been made, can be turned into long-term development uh, based on uh, a new transformation. Uh, that's what I haven't seen. So I've seen good performance in Rwanda. I've seen good performance in Ethiopia. Uh, they are not industrialized yet. Um, there was a question, in Juguna's question was, do we know the objective function of uh, politicians? No, we don't. But for me, it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter because we should build the institutions that will force them to conform. Uh, we should build the institutions that, uh, so if we have a strong civil society, uh, it pushes, it, it makes a, 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 a um, negligible what the objective function of the politician is. Because in the new rule of law, uh, there's a way of dealing with that. There should be a way of dealing with corrupt politicians. That's, that's the argument that I make over here. The, the free trade area, how likely is it uh, to, I think it's a good initiative, uh, so long as the African Union is willing to make the kind of commitment uh, to make it work. I've seen many initiatives, uh, not nearly so much, but uh, other coming from, also coming from the African Union that have not really uh, function properly uh, because governments have not made the commitments uh, and follow through with the commitment that they have made. So um, it all depends on how individual countries, so it depends on South Africa, it depends on Nigeria. So I do hope that uh, uh, Nigeria will soon uh, make up its mind on the, on the free trade area. Uh, Paul's question was about Mauritius. Why nobody's talking about Mauritius? I don't even know why. Uh, I don't know why we're talking about Mauritius, but clearly Mauritius is uh, an outlier in the examples that uh, we, we've given here. Um, I haven't paid much attention to the politics of Mauritius. I know more about the economy than I do about the politics. But there are a few outliers in Africa. I mean, I, I talked about Rwanda being an outlier, uh, Botswana another outlier. So there are quite a few outliers in Africa, uh, but my uh, area of focus is in the uh, countries like uh, Uganda, Tanzania, Zambia, Ghana. Uh, you know, these are the countries that I'm looking at. Uh, so I will look at Mauritius as an outlier. Thank you, Ernest. Uh, we, we've almost come to the end of this uh, annual lecture. I mean, I guess I'm sitting here and, and thinking that, that maybe it's not democracy per se, uh, which is, how can I say, at fault, but maybe the way in which the transition to democracy has been handled in a number of cases, and maybe it is about how do we bring strong African leaders to be accountable. Maybe that's sort of the, the thing that's sitting at the core of, 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 of the messages that we have been discussing, at least that's sort of how I understand some of the messages. I, I would like to very much express my sincere thanks to Ernest for being willing to put difficult questions on the table, questions that should be addressed, questions that should be discussed, both here in Helsinki, but also across Africa and across the development community. I'd like you to join me in an applause for Ernest.
Thank you very much. <laughs>